the motion has passed with three yeses. Uh, I think now we want to bring up um, Dylan Gibson, right, kind of doing an update on the special election. And, and uh, Chair, if I could, um, we're fine with that. We just have to make a, a, a formal motion with the commissioners just to amend the order of the agenda, if you would. We have a motion to amend the agenda to discuss our redistricting mm -hmm. process. So moved. Second. <laughs> Second. Second. And you can just do a voice vote. You don't need to do a electronic vote. We all vote. All in favor? Yes. yes. Aye. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. So let's move to that portion of the. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair and members of the Planning Commission. My name is Dylan Gibson. I'm the City Clerk for the City of Commerce City, Colorado. With me tonight, I also have Jordan Roberts, who is our Deputy City Clerk uh, there at the back of the room. Um, give me just a second, and I will get the presentation going. So Jordan and I are coming before you tonight. Uh, we are uh, discussing two big projects that the city is currently undergoing with related uh, with relation to redistricting in the city. And as part of that, Part of that program, we're doing community information sessions, we're meeting with our various boards and commissions, and we're getting the word out there, right? We want the, the community and the residents to be informed of what we're doing and their role in the process. So we'll be going over the, the two projects that interrelate. They're distinct, but they do uh, kind of talk to each other and play off of each other as part of this process. So um, throughout 2022, we're inviting residents uh, to participate in the two major projects that's gonna shape Commerce City for the years to come. The first is gonna be getting resident feedback about the makeup and structure of city council seats with uh, a potential special election in November of this year. The second project is going to be the re redistricting of the city's wards following the 2020 census. Um, as a little bit of background, uh, just some basic information, uh, voters approved the current Commerce City Charter at the May 5th, 1970 election. And that charter has been amended various times since 1970. Uh, one of the sections that hasn't been amended since 1970 has been the council composition and the ward structure. And so, uh, again, for those that aren't familiar, city council has nine seats, uh, one of which is the mayor. Four members are elected from each of the city's four wards, and four members are elected at large, meaning a vote of the entire city. And that's the structure we've had since 1970. And various city councils uh, in the recent past and the uh, current city council today have had an interest in evaluating whether or not that composition for the Commerce City Council is the composition that the residents would like to see in 2022 and beyond. So if you're not familiar, uh, this is a map of Commerce City and we have our four wards. So we have Ward 2, Ward 1, 3, and 4. And uh, the redistricting process may change these current ward boundaries, um, but the overall composition where we have the yellow boundary being of the entire city where the mayor and the four at-large members are elected, and then we have our four wards, one uh, council member is elected from each of those four wards. Uh, I don't think it's any uh, news to anybody, especially anybody on the planning commission, but Commerce City is one of the fastest growing cities in the front range. Uh, the newly developed northeast portion of the city has seen the largest population increase over the last decade and has changed the makeup of Commerce City overall. Commerce City in 2022 looks vastly different than Commerce City in 1970. Uh, again, the city council has been interested in proposing potential charter changes related to the council composition in recent years, and the previous city council uh, approved the 2022 budget and the 2022 work plan, which has given us the funding and the go-ahead to conduct a community survey which will happen in early 2022 to get resident feedback about uh, potential changes of the council composition for a special election in November of 2022. There's gonna be some uh, other questions on the uh, survey related to uh, the role of the mayor, how many council members there should be, uh, should we have an all at large or an all ward system? Um, but the biggest uh, portion of the survey is going to be six options that we've researched from communities around Colorado and the United States of how they have their council composition to see if residents are interested in any of those uh, six options for what Commerce City may look like. So the first option that you're gonna see on your survey, um, I'll note that there's gonna be a sample size of a couple thousand households uh, that will get a mailed paper survey and that'll be available in both English and in Spanish. 
but council was very uh, interested in making sure that we got the entire community feedback. So for those not in the sample portion of the survey, we will be sending what's called a push to web mail card, which will have a link uh, for you to go to and fill out the same survey online, again, both English and in Spanish, and we'll be able to break those um, results out by both the surveyed households and then the community at large um, for the results. So the first option you're gonna see is no change, right? Keep the council composition as it is, four at-large members, four ward members, and one mayor elected at large. Um, I will note that redistricting requirements will modify the current ward boundaries, uh, but that's the first option, right? Keep things how they are. The second option is requiring our at-large members uh, to have a geographic residency requirement. So this would uh, retain the current council composition of nine members, but it would require the at-large members to reside within certain geographic areas, similar to existing wards, but not, uh, not the same. So generally the southwest, northwest, north central, northeast portions of the city. At-large members would still be elected by a vote of the entire city, meaning everybody in the city gets to vote on those at-large members, but they would have to be roughly evenly spread throughout the city rather than having two or more uh, at-large members residing in the same general area. So again, a map of the city, we have our four wards. Uh, each ward gets to elect their own council member. The at-large members would be roughly spread out through the entire city instead of having two or more uh, elected um, from the same, or residing within the same general area. So it's just a way for our at-large members to be spread more uh, evenly throughout the city. There's no requirement currently for any at-large member uh, that they can't live within, you know, uh, a certain radius or distance or anywhere from uh, a portion of the city. The third option would be that all eight members uh, of council would be elected from each of the city's four wards. So instead of having uh, four at-large members, those four members would uh, each be divided into the city's four wards. So each ward would have two council members uh, representing their ward. Those members would be elected uh, on staggered terms. So ward one, for example, would elect their first uh, council member in 2023, and they would serve until 2027. The second council member would be elected in 2025 and serve until 2029. So again, uh, there would be no at-large members of the city. The mayor would still be elected at large, but there would be no at-large council member, and instead, Ward 4, 3, 2, and 1 would all have two council members each representing their ward. The next option would be that we have an all ward system, similar to the last option, but instead of, in, instead of having four wards, we'd break those wards out into eight smaller wards, and one council, council member would be elected from each of the city's then eight wards. The mayor would still be elected at large. So we had our GIS division uh, draft up what a, an approximate map may look like with eight smaller wards. I just wanna note that this is a visual representation this isn't anything um, that we would propose for redistricting, right? Uh, if you know the community wanted to move forward with an eight ward system and the uh, voters approved that charter amendment, um, this wouldn't be the, the final map, right? Just a visual representation. But these smaller maps are the smaller wards in the map. Uh, each council member would be elected from each of the eight wards and then the mayor would be elected at large. The uh, fifth option is almost uh, completely opposite of that, which would be an all at-large system. So all council members would be elected at large, meaning a vote of the entire city. And this would eliminate the city's wards and ward council members. So again, uh, yellow boundary map of the entire city, every council member and the mayor would be elected at large, meaning a vote of the entire city and they would live uh, anywhere. There would be no wards or geographic requirement for them to reside anywhere in the city. And then the last option is kind of a hybrid option. This would be an all at large system with a residency requirement. So all council members, again, would still be elected at large, but each council member would represent a general geographic area of interest within the city. And this would still elim eliminate the city's ward and ward council members. Uh, so this survey is gonna arrive in resident mailboxes by the end of March. Uh, about halfway through the process, reminder surveys and reminder postcards will be mailed out. Results will be analyzed and then presented to city council sometime in mid-2022. And then at that point, based on the results and the information that council gets, they will make a determination uh, whether to call a special election and set the ballot title, basically meaning what charter amendment do they want to put forward to voters in November of 2022. If 
there's a special election and voters approve that charter amendment, then that would be in effect for the November of 2023 regular municipal election when the city elects our council members. So that's the uh, council composition and survey um, portion. Now we're gonna get into redistricting. Uh, so every 10 years, uh, Congress conducts a U.S. Census. We just had the 2020 Census conducted uh, a little uh, less than two years ago now. Um, and that's used to determine representation in Congress. States then use that data collected to add or remove uh, U.S. congressional districts, right? Colorado had a population increase, so we now have an eighth congressional district. District boundaries may be uh, must be redrawn to satisfy certain constitutional doctrines, such as equal populations among the districts, and to make sure that no district is drawn to dilute the voting power uh, between districts or among minority groups. So Commerce City has started our redistricting process in 2022. Per the Commerce City Charter, new ward boundaries must be approved by the City Council no later than 180 days before the next regular municipal election. Our next regular municipal election is in November of 2023. So City Council's last day to approve any new ward maps is gonna be Thursday, May 11th, 2023. So that's kind of the deadline that we're working towards right now. Um, when government entities redraw their districts or in the city's case, our ward boundaries, there are several requirements and considerations that we need to satisfy or uh, take into consideration as we, be we begin to redraw our ward maps. So again, the first two I've already talked about, each ward needs to be, uh, have equal populations. Municipalities are generally afforded 10% um, or less uh, disparity between the largest district and the smallest district within the city. Our goal is obviously zero, um, to make sure that every ward has roughly the, the same population as all the other wards. We also can't redraw our wards uh, to dilute the voting power of minority groups within the city. Wards must be drawn to be uh, compact and contiguous, right? So we can't have a ward drawn that snakes unnecessarily up through the city, and it also can't be um, disconnected from any other portion of the district. It all needs to be uh, as compact as possible geographically, and it also needs to be contiguous. We should strive our best to preserve existing boundaries, so um, that can be county precincts, county commissioner districts, the state house and state senate districts, and the Colorado congressional districts. We wanna make sure that we do our best not to split uh, districts that are above us um, for the city. And then lastly, and where we're gonna get most of our uh, community input, is gonna be preserving communities of interest within the city. So communities of interest are geographic areas uh, that are composed of people who share similar policy concerns and should be kept whole within a single district or ward. So those people that share those similar policy concerns and live, live within the same general area can all get together and elect the best representative on city council for their, uh, their issue or their concerns. Policy interests can range from anything from racial, social, or economic interests, demographic, uh, economic, uh, environmental, transportational, or other similar uh, features of their community. A community of interest should be able to tell its own unique story that's distinguishable from another surrounding community from it. And most importantly, communities of interest should be defined by their local community members. Uh, Jordan and I work here. Uh, we you know, uh, frequent the businesses and the parks and all the amenities in Commerce City. Um, but it does no good for us to sit in our offices and tell us, uh, or tell the community, right, this is your community of interest, this is what you should, um, this is uh, what ward you should be in. We want residents to be able to define that for us, and we take that in consideration as we draft our community uh, of interest maps and as we draft our new ward boundaries uh, going into 2023. So we're using a tool called Representable uh, to gather community of interest maps from residents. Uh, Representable is gonna walk the community through the redistricting process. Uh, we're gonna ask for some basic information such as name and address, and we use this information so we can plot out if we're getting a lot of submissions in a certain part of the city, but very few in another part. We can do some targeted outreach and recruitment to make sure that no part of the city is being left out of this process or you know they're unaware or they just weren't informed. But we wanna make sure that every uh, resident in the city has an opportunity to participate. Uh, we're gonna ask you to tell us what makes your community unique, and then finally, we're gonna ask you to draw your map and submit it for our consideration as we redraw the wards uh, going into 2023. 
So I'm going to provide just a general overview of what that representable tool looks like, uh, some final information, and then uh, if you have any questions or comments for me and Jordan, uh, we'll be around to answer those uh, for you. So uh, whenever you log into our representable portal, and any of these links are going to be available on the city's website, they're going to be available on our Facebook and social media pages, um, they're going to be readily available for anybody to find. So we have our uh, little intro splash page. So if we click the um, Get Started button, it's going to go ahead and get us uh, going. So for this example, I just filled in my name. Uh, I use the Commerce City Civic Center as just the example address uh, here. But again, we're just gathering basic information to make sure that we can uh, ensure that no general part of the city uh, we're not getting maps from. Uh, this next step, we're going to, again, ask what makes our community of interest unique. So uh, for this example, right, I wrote that we're near the South Adams County Fire Protection District in the Dick Sporting Goods Park. Uh, we host uh, sporting events, concerts, and we're a hub for seeking pe uh, people seeking government services like passport applications or building permits, right? So no other area uh, generally within our community provides this kind of service. Our community of interest is unique in that regard. Um, it's going to ask you to name your community, so again, the Commerce City Civic Center, and then uh, select some general tags that we can use to filter out some of these maps and uh, group them up whenever we go to evaluate these, whenever we redraw the wards. So you can choose from this list here up to five. If you click on the plus button right here, it's actually going to bring up a, a big old list with hundreds and hundreds of different tags that you can use. And again, this is for us to help filter similar communities of interest. So if there are similar communities of interest in the same ge general geographic area, we can do our best to keep those within the same ward. Uh, from here, we're going to ask you to enter your uh, home address. So the map will zoom in on your general location here. Uh, here it zoomed in on the Commerce City Civic Center. And, and to use this tool, right, uh, the map is going to break it down by census blocks. Whenever you click on a block, it kind of turns this grayish blue color here. And that'll be uh, the start of your map. So you, if you go around here and you click all the blocks that are part of what you define as your community of interest, they'll turn blue. You can use a tool up here in the right-hand corner to increase the selection size. So you can select multiple blocks at a time instead of trying to go through and click all these pretty small uh, census blocks. Uh, if you mess up, you can use the erase feature, the undo feature. If you've just um, gone too far past the point, you can clear your map as well and start all over. Um, once you've got your general community of interest map selected here, um, so again, I did the uh, Civic Center and Dick Sporting Goods Park up to the, the high school, out to the rec center, and then just in this general area. The same general rules are going to apply whenever you fill out this map, right? It needs to all be touching. Uh, I can't select a block down here and then select uh, a few up here and not connect them. Whenever you submit a community of interest, they all need to be connected. Once I'm satisfied with my map, and this is a map I want Dylan and Jordan to take into consideration as they draft their new wards of what communities they want to keep together, I'm going to click Save. It's going to ask you to uh, agree to some general terms of use. And then from here, you can click Submit and actually submit your map to Jordan and I. Uh, you're going to get a, um, a final map submission of what your map generally looks like. You can select some data layers to compare what your map uh, is compared to, you know, uh, we got the zip codes, we've got the existing wards, we've got the Commerce City neighborhoods, uh, past election data and demographic data from the census as well. From here, you can also download a copy of your map. Or if you're interested in seeing what other Commerce City residents have submitted, you can go to the public input portal, and it will show you any map that's been submitted as part of this uh, process. So draft maps, uh, Jordan and I are hoping to have those submitted to council and public comment in late 2022, our first stab at what the new ward boundaries would be. We'll take council feedback and public comment uh, in the early 2023 and propose final maps uh, to council sometime in February or March. Again, Council's adoption of the new ward maps ahead of the 2023 election is in May. And then those will be for the effective for the November 2023 regular municipal election and onward until we get to the 2030 census and start the process all over. Um, you don't need to write these down, um, but these are uh, links uh, for some resources uh, for the uh, program. So our representable portal 
This link and then the voting uh, register to vote link will all be available at c3gov.com backslash redistricting. It's gonna have uh, both uh, processes laid out. There's gonna be a recording of our community information session. Uh, right now it's available in English if you're interested in watching that. We're currently working on getting a Spanish translation version of that uh, on the website as well. So it's available in both languages as well as uh, any necessary links, uh, whether it's the uh, mapping tool, the public import, uh, public portal tool, uh, city's charter, and then the register to vote uh, link as well. So those are the two programs. We just wanted to kind of fill you all in uh, with what's going on. If you have any questions, uh, I can answer any of those at those time, but uh, thank you for your time tonight. I greatly appreciate it. What role will planning commission play in the narrowing down the yeah, so Choices. I mean, as individuals, right, submitting your community of interest map, uh, participating in the survey that's coming in the mailboxes, and then whenever we get to those draft maps, um, we're going to be also uh, showing those around, again, to the boards and commissions, again, right, getting uh, input, whether it's planning commission, uh, you know, the public safety advisory board, our parks and rec board, all of those will um, have an opportunity to view those draft maps as well as the community. When you say, um, when you say you, the, you, so you're gonna take a combination of all these maps mm -hmm. and then you're gonna look at them, will there be any, any boundary changes in the current wards that we have? Yeah, that's what this is specifically for. So our okay. current ward maps um, are gonna, you know, we're, we're looking at adjusting those based on the census data that we just got in 2020, um, as well as these community of, uh, community of interest maps that we're soliciting from the public. Understood. Yeah. Just uh, thank you for the presentation. And um, this is not new, at least to myself, from my time on council. Uh, we knew that this time would come one day with redistricting um, and with the um, boundaries that are there. Um, uh, more for folks that might be watching this presentation right now. So as the um, population grows up in the north, um, if we decide and council would move to uh, have uh, these smaller redistrictings and get away from uh, the ward system, if you will, um, the north population or the core city would be could potentially be outvoted over and over and over um, from a funding perspective, from a project's perspective, from um, a diversity perspective. There's a lot of things to uh, keep in mind when these maps are being drawn. So I would hope that in your presentation to um, the different boards and commissions that um, you are thoughtful and bringing those items up so that they are aware because they will probably hear it for the first time and just um, not fully understand what that means. Um, and then I guess my question for you is that um, the boards and commissions will be advisory, correct, to city council, and council has uh, the ultimate authority of the ballot language, correct? Uh, that is correct. So council sets a ballot title, and they also are the final approval for the ward maps. And those um, ward maps, again, uh, per the charter, have to be approved no later than 180 days before the next regular municipal election. So that's why we're starting you know, over a year early, because we want to make sure we have ample time to inform the community, get community input, and then propose any draft maps for public comment out there as part of the process. Right, very good for the clarification. I just want to make sure that you know that we're being thoughtful and not just giving a thought and, and running down um, the road uh, with scissors to uh, create inequities across the city because that has been identified for a long time. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you. Have a great night. We will now move to our first case of the evening. Sarah, do you want to introduce the case? Good evening. First case is S-809-22. That's Brighton 27J School District. Requests approval of the South Lawn Elementary filing number one, lot one, final plat to create one lot from one existing tract consisting of 10.61 acres to allow development of a new school on the property located at the northwest corner 
of Walden Street and East 100th Avenue, Zone Reunion, PUD, Plan Unit Development District. Presenting from the city is Harry Brennan, Planner. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, good evening, Commission. Uh, this first case before you tonight, um, as mentioned, is S-80922, uh, South Lawn Elementary School Filing 1, Lot 1, Subdivision. Staff enters into the public record the contents of this case file, the subdivision regulations, and this digital presentation. Additionally, this property is located within the City of Commerce City. All required notification and posting requirements have been met. Therefore, Planning Commission does have jurisdiction to hear this case. A bit of a summary, uh, this property is located at the northwest corner of East 100th Avenue and Walden Street. So the request here is approval of a subdivision track, or excuse me, approval of a subdivision plat uh, to change a tract to a lot. Uh, the current zoning, as Sarah mentioned, is uh, PUD, um, specifically the uh, Reunion Plan Unit Development Amendment Number 1, which identifies this property as a school site. Uh, and the future land use plan also designates this area as a uh, public use, uh, in particular a school site. And just a little context, um, a comprehensive plan, in, a, in addition to the future land use plan, which is included with it, is a guiding policy document um, that informs future decisions about uh, zoning, uh, new PUDs, uh, zo re rezonings uh, and zoning changes, things like that. A zoning is the actual regulatory document that governs the uh, land use and the specifics of the development in particular areas. Uh, in addition to the LDC, uh, in this case, the reunion amendment number one, as I mentioned, is this zoning document. And this subdivision plot uh, does not propose changes to either of those uh, sources of policy and regulation. Uh, it does not propose to change the zoning, the allowed land uses, or the development standards for this property. Uh, this subdivision plot is solely intended to uh, designate this parcel as a lot instead of a tract uh, the way it is in the uh, current subdivision plot um, and also to create the necessary easements for utilities and infrastructure. It is uh, important to note this is a bit of a unique case uh, because uh, as a subdivision plot uh, related to the development of a public school, um, public schools are not in particular, are not subject to the city's typical uh, local development review process, uh, as, as you would see with other developments. Instead, uh, much of the development, uh, the development of the school itself is reviewed and approved at the state level. And so this application is, is really just the, the plat that's before us tonight. Um, state statute does, does sort of specify uh, the authority of the city versus the uh, authority reserved to the state in the review of public schools. And so the city can regulate access points uh, and regional drainage, uh, things, things that include offsite improvements. Uh, the city cannot regulate sort of the specifics of the development of the school itself, including the type of the school, the architecture, uh, the overall site design, signage, um, and student population, sort of the areas that will also be served by the school, those kind of things. The property here is located in the, in the midst of a, a primarily developed uh, residential area uh, with uh, perimeter streets on each side of it. And this, uh, this area, I should note, is from August uh, over the summer. Um, as you can see currently, uh, obviously the school is under construction already, uh, which is, is not typical um, in sort of the order of things. Uh, this, I, I, I want to, I guess, clarify that uh, this isn't, you know, any any willful intent on the school's side of things to um, to sort of get out of order with our typical processes. Uh, instead, this was just sort of a a nature of uh, the development and the approval of the school itself, going through a separate process with the state and receiving approval uh, through the state. 
uh, that was independent from this plot uh, application and process that we're handling now. So um, again, that's that's why this is sort of a atypical thing. As I mentioned, the future land use plan does identify this site as a, a public use as a school site. And in formal terms, uh, the Brighton 27J School District requests approval of the South Lawn Elementary filing number one, lot one, final plat to create, to create one lot from one existing tract consisting of 10.61 acres to allow development of a new school on the property located at the northwest corner of Walden Street and East 100th Avenue, which is zone PUD. In a little additional context about process, um, as you may be aware, subdivisions are uh, typically reviewed and approved administratively in accordance with the LDC. Uh, but public notice and council notification is a part of this process prior to staff's final approval. Um, in this case, uh, city council did call this, this plat up um, during that posting period, which is why it's before you this evening. For case history, uh, this, this property is or was originally included in the uh, original reunion PUD zone document. Uh, a subsequent amendment, amendment number one, uh, clarified the location of the school site as uh, the street network in this area became a little more defined. Uh, and then in 2004, uh, the reunion filing 17 subdivision platted out the residential neighborhood that surrounds the school, uh, including 41 residential lots and five tracks, one of which was the uh, parcel that's before us tonight. It was labeled as tract E in that original plat. And this is an excerpt from the PUD zone document. As you can see, uh, the PUD did anticipate this area um, or this particular parcel being for school development. The plat itself, uh, one important thing to note is that no property lines are actually being changed by this subdivision plat. Uh, instead, you could think about it uh, primarily as a change in text um, because this lot or this parcel, uh, as I mentioned, was originally designated as a tract rather than a lot. And due to requirements in the LDC, uh, this update was needed uh, because tracts are typically um, typically used for things like open space and drainage uh, where no actual development is anticipated. Uh, other actions by this plat include dedication of new utility, uh, utility easements, drainage easements, and fire hydrant easements to ensure access for the fire district. And this slide is just for reference. Um, again, this is not part of the plat application before you tonight, but this is just sort of to help give you a little bit of scale about the uh, overall lot and sort of how it would how it would function. And in reviewing this plat, staff reviewed it against the technical requirements of the reunion amendment number one PUD zone document, the city's subdivision standards and the policies within the comprehensive plan. Staff did distribute the plat for review to all of our ref uh, relevant referral agencies which include the utility companies and providers, um, South Adams County Fire District, uh, as well as uh, many in internal city departments. And this chart summarizes some of the key issues that we look at uh, in terms of access. As I mentioned, it is surrounded by previously dedicated right of way uh, in terms of Walden Street, uh, Eurovan Street, South Lawn Parkway and East 100th Avenue. I'll, I'll talk about these a little more um, on the next slide or next couple slides. Uh, it does fit in with the comprehensive plan designation of uh, school site for this area. In terms of lot frontage and lot size, the PUD uh, does not offer uh, or does not specify, I should say, uh, a minimum lot frontage or lot size for a school site. So uh, those standards are not applicable. Uh, no, no additional right-of-way dedication is needed, uh, as I mentioned, since there is right-of-way already dedicated around this lot. And the, as for the surrounding streets, uh, Walden Street and East 100th Avenue uh, are built, and they, they are built to, um, 
to the minor collector street standards uh, in, in uh, terms of Commerce City's standards for streets. Uh, currently, on-street parking is allowed on both of those streets. Uh, Yerevan Street and Southland Parkway uh, meet the city's standards for local residential streets. And currently, on-street parking is allowed on Yerevan, but not on Southland Parkway. In terms of the road network and traffic impacts, uh, some of the off-site improvements will include new crosswalks, a new turn lane on Walden Street, uh, and a new drop-off lane along Southland. South Lawn Parkway. Uh, the city did not review a traffic study for this as this was included in the state review of the project. Uh, there were no DRT concerns related to the impacts to the road network from the subdivision plat, um, at least none that were raised in our review or referrals. If future offsite traffic calming is needed, uh, Commerce City Public Works uh, can review that and, and work with the, the district to find solutions. In terms of project benefits, uh, the development review team feels strongly that the project will be a valued addition to the neighborhood uh, in this particular area of the Northern Range. An approval of this requested subdivision um, and the creation of this lot rather than tract will help to establish the community vision in this area uh, as is established by the reunion amendment number one PUD and the comprehensive plan. And of course, um, the, the creation of this school will, uh, will aid 27J, District 27J, in providing services to a, a growing population in the Northern Range. The LDC provides nine specific criteria from which um, plats may be approved, uh, or which plats are evaluated against, I should say. Uh, criteria A, <coughs> the subdivision is consistent with any approved rezoning, concept plan, or PUD zone document. Uh, staff did find that the application meets this criterion. As, uh, as mentioned, um, this, this subdivision plat uh, furthers the intent of the PUD zone document and meets the standards uh, that were provided for uh, subdivisions in that. The subdivision is consistent with and implements the intent of the specific zoning district in which it is located. Again, the specific zoning for this property is the reunion PUD amendment number one. And again, the, uh, the application uh, staff finds that this application does meet this criteria. Criteria C, there is no evidence to suggest that the subdivision violates any state, federal, or local laws, regulations, or requirements. Uh, staff do find that this is the case and this application meets this criterion. Criterion D, the general layout of lots, roads, driveways, utilities, drainage facilities, and other services within the proposed subdivision is designed in a way that minimizes the amount of land disturbance, maximizes the amount of open space in the development, preserves existing trees, vegetation, and riparian areas, and otherwise accomplishes the purposes and intent of the LDC. And this criteria is, is perhaps more, more geared towards a multi-lot subdivision, but uh, staff do find that the overall layout is orderly. Uh, the lot closely lines up with the underlying planning area in the PUD zone document, and so staff do find that the application meets this criteria. Criteria E, the subdivision complies with all applicable city standards and does not unnecessarily create lots or patterns of lots that make compliance with such standards difficult or infeasible. Staff do find that the application meets this criterion. Uh, the subdivision either will not result in substantial or undue adverse effects, or those effects have been mitigated to the maximum extent feasible. The staff's knowledge uh, adverse effects due to traffic and parking will be mitigated in the development of the school. Um, mitigation efforts uh, include those offsite improvements that I mentioned previously, uh, drop off lanes, uh, internal parking, things like that. Uh, so staff do find that the plat also meets this criterion, uh, specifically criterion uh, item two. Criteria G. Adequate and sufficient public safety, transportation, utility facilities and services, recreation facilities, parks, and schools are available to serve the, the subject property while maintaining sufficient levels of service to existing development. 
uh, and all referral agencies that reviewed this proposal, uh, including the utility providers, uh, Parks and Rec, Police, and the Fire District, have all indicated an ability to serve this, this proposed lot and have not raised any objections. So staff also find that the application meets this criterion. Criterion H, uh, a development agreement between the city and applicant has been executed uh, according to our public works, an internal uh, public works department. Uh, no development agreement is necessary for this, uh, this, this subdivision plat. So this criterion is not applicable. Uh, and finally, uh, the proposed phasing plan for development of the subdivision is rational. Uh, there is no phasing plan required uh, or proposed with the subdivision plot, so staff find that this criterion is not applicable. In summary, uh, the development review team did review this case in a meeting on September 30th, 2021. Uh, from that meeting, the DRT made an official recommendation of approval for this particular case. And furthermore, the DRT recommends for this plat request that the plat meets the approval criteria for a final plat as set forth in the LDC. And further recommends that the Planning Commission uh, forward the final plat request to City Council with a favorable recommendation. For this meeting, the uh, required public notice was met and as of um, this afternoon, there were no uh, no public comments received uh, on this application. With that, um, the applicant members of the applicant team are are here tonight over Zoom. Um, they do not have an applicant presentation, but they are happy to answer any questions. Uh, I am also uh, happy to answer any questions you may have. So, with that, uh, we can open it up. So the applicant doesn't have a presentation. No, sir. No. Okay. Uh, questions. Um, I think the first question that I had is, you know, we, we talked a lot about, I think you talked about the city's right regulation authority over this this case. Access was I think one of those items that we do have authority on, right? And you talked about the traffic study, but then, did I hear you correct that the city did not review the traffic study on that? And why wouldn't the city review that if, you know, it seems like that would have been a key area for the city to review for traffic in and out of the school? Sure, that's that's a, a good question. So we we did not review a traffic study for this particular project. Um, it was included. A, a traffic study was included in the state review, um, and I suppose staff didn't request one uh, because the the ability of staff to to request uh, request changes in terms of site design and things like that. Uh, is fairly limited uh, since we are not not able to impose conditions on the development of the site itself besides access points as you mentioned um, and for that reason we, we did not request a, a traffic study um, I don't know if that answers your question but well I guess if, if we felt the there was items in the traffic study that would have caused crosswalks or maybe a potential of a stoplight or any of those type of things right those would have been agreements that we could have discussed with the applicant. Yeah, offsite improvements um, could potentially be on the table, and and those are, if, if the need arises for those, um, that's not necessarily off the table either. If if uh, public works finds that traffic flows um, in the area at those intersections uh, do demand more than more than stop signs, um, that is certainly something that can be can can be revisited as as improvements later on. Um, Mr. Chair, just to build on that too, I think when this area was originally zoned, when you saw that reunion amendment that called mm -hmm. it out to be a school, there was a traffic study at that time as well. So oh, there yeah. has been a overall traffic study for the whole South Lawn area that looked at the overall road network and available uses. So that was done at part of that time as well. So you feel, Ms. Timms, that we've, we've done our due diligence on making they, sure they, that they, the they probably network... Updated. They did probably a conformance letter to that original study, but there was a study done as part of that original zoning. Yeah, I think one area that, you know, a traffic study would show, you know, from the school, I believe the bus routes are a mile outside that area. So now that, you know, a lot of the South Lawn neighborhoods are going to be within that mile, you know, people living west of Reunion Parkway especially, 
you know, having kids now walking across Reunion Parkway, which is a main feeder out to 96 for people to leave, you know, it has shown that, you know, you're gonna have a lot of foot traffic at certain times of the day with no stop signs for Reunion Parkway or crosswalks right now. So, you know, that I think would be an issue that would have been flagged or could be flagged now. Because when the old traffic study was done, a lot of those houses were probably still being built on the west side of Reunion Parkway. But yes. the population's probably a little different. Yes, but it, it took into account all the single family homes that built out. You, you said there would be crosswalks, right? That's and, correct, and yes. And will those be lighted? You know, there's two types of crosswalks. There's a crosswalk, and then there's a crosswalk that has a light that actually stops traffic. Do you know what type of crosswalks these will be? I don't have that information in front of me. The, the applicant might be able to provide more detail on that. Um, Trisha or Caitlin, is it possible to give speaking, um, sorry, like speaking permissions to uh, Carrie Monty from the school district? Or Carly Olson? Carly, you should be able to unmute yourself. Carly, one moment, please. We're not able to hear you. Unmute. Okay, try now, please. There she goes. Um, texting, but they need to speak to this. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, all. Uh, I'm the civil engineering project manager for the 27J uh, school here, and just wanted to clarify: we did prepare a traffic study that was reviewed by the transportation department, um, and they back based on that study. We added a turn lane to the northeast side of the site, dedicated additional right of way for that as part of the evaluation. Um, so while Harry's portion of the plat side might not have reviewed it in his department, the transportation side did review and comment. And I'm happy to answer any questions about that. Was your uh, traffic study that was reviewed by you know, basically the state just in and around the area around the school or where did you look at off-site impacts a certain distance away? They, this traffic study wasn't just submitted to the state. It was actually submitted to Commerce City's Transportation Department. Um, so they did provide comment. And there, I don't have the exact details on the study in front of me, but it did include all the things that the, the Transportation Department for Commerce City requested. Okay, so that's good to hear, and maybe that's different than what you said, Mr. Brennan. So Commerce City's Traffic Department did review the traffic study and provide recommendations, and those were incorporated by the applicant. I Correct. think that's what we Correct. Yeah, wanted and, to. And so it sounds like question. the traffic study wasn't submitted as part of this specific subdivision application, but that the Public Works Department was involved in the traffic study um, related to the development of the school itself. So it, it, it may just be the sort of scope of material that was packaged with this particular subdivision plat uh, did not include that information. Okay. Any further questions from the commissioners? Uh, we'll now move over to the public comments from those who are in person and those that are online. Um, we can now have public comment virtually. So if anyone wishes to uh, speak about the case in person, please step to the podium. I don't think we have anyone present that would like to speak in person. Uh, we will now move to our virtual presentation. Do you not believe we have anybody registered? Fisher Caitlin from virtually. 
If there is anybody that indicated that they did not want to speak that would like to now provide comments, please uh, use the raise hand feature. Okay, so that will conclude the virtual comments for this case. Thank you. Uh, members of the public were also asked, able to submit comments online or by mail, and there were no written comments received. Um, we will now close the public hearing and um, ask for a motion for the case. I move that the Planning Commission enter a finding that the requested final plat for the property located at the northwest corner of Walden Street and East 100th Avenue contained in case S-809-22 meets the criteria of the Land Development Code and based upon such finding, recommend that the City Council approve the final plat. I second. Dis any discussion from the commissioners? No, I would just, well, yes, I actually have uh, just more of a commentary on uh, school sites and whatnot. Um, traditionally, they do have the option uh, if it's a school site to uh, permit through the state. However, if you need utilities and uh, other adverse impacts to uh, like kind of a, a site, if you will, um, that's where you need to negotiate with uh, the authorities having jurisdiction. So in this case would be like South Adams Water or if you need power in Excel or whoever that is. So this isn't one of those, hey, we're trying to dupe you out of the system. It's actually, um, a permit review process, which is a lot faster um, to go through the state uh, because it's a little less cumbersome. Uh, I've worked with uh, Denver Public Schools for eight years doing new school construction, and every time that was the way to go was through the state. Um, so I just want you all to be aware that um, this is just one of those kind of process pieces that have to happen, and so I feel completely comfortable uh, in uh, approving this the way it was presented. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Amador. Any further comments? We have them. I, th I think it's just an interesting, uh, you know, like you were saying, it's kind of a special case because, you know, we're, we're not as much advisory on this one as we are, you know, reporting when I drive by how good the construction looks because, you know, grading, access, and everything's already done. So it's just kind of an interesting case. Truth. Have a motion. We have a second. Second. All for a vote. If you could vote electronically. The motion has passed. Five yeses, zero noes. Thank you, Mr. Brennan, for the presentation and for 27J for joining us. Ms. Guy, are you pleased to introduce our second case of the evening? Next case is case number Z-722-00-21, and that's Potomac, Potomac Farms Metro District requests approval to amend the approved Potomac Farms PUD to modernize and allow additional entryway signs located at the northwest corner of East 104th Avenue and Worcester Drive, zone Potomac Farms PUD, Plan Unit Development District. Presenting from the city will be Dalton Cuera. Sorry if I murdered your last name. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I just pronounced Guerra, by the way. <laughs> no worries, though. Thank you. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, good evening, Commission. Uh, my name is Dalton Garris, City Planner, Commerce City uh, Planning Division. Uh, this is case number Z7220021 for the Potomac Farms uh, PUD Amendment Number One. That uh, is uh, located generally in the northwest corner of East 104th Avenue and Worcester Drive. Uh, the applicant is the Potomac Farms Metro District. Staff enters into the public record the contents of the case file, the PUD zone document, regulations, and this digital presentation. Additionally, the property is located within the City of Commerce City, 
all required notification and posting requirements have been met. Therefore, the Planning Commission does have jurisdiction to hear this case. As I mentioned, the location is generally the northwest corner of East 104th Avenue and Worcester Drive. They're requesting an approval of an amendment to the Potomac Farms PUD zone document. The current zoning is PUD for the Potomac Farms and the future land use plan is residential. In accordance with section 21-32512 of the Land Development Code, the planned unit developments are reviewed by the Development Review Team and the Director of Community Development. A Planning Commission then holds a public hearing and provides a recommendation to the City Council. City Council holds a public hearing and makes a final decision to, a, to approve, approve with conditions or deny the application based on the approval criteria from section 21-32513. A little background on the case, uh, Potomac Farms is an existing built out single family subdivision. Uh, the Potomac Farms PUD was approved by the city council in 2000. The sign types and standards were part of this approval. Uh, the proposed amendment would allow additional entryway signs in the subdivision, throughout the subdivision. For a little context, the uh, yellow line outlines uh, the general area of the Potomac Farms PUD. Uh, the single family subdivision. The future land use plan is residential medium, uh, although there are no changes being proposed to the land use itself. It's simply for the addition of uh, entryway signs and the update of some existing signs. The Potomac Farms Metro District is requesting approval of an amendment to the Potomac Farms zone document to update, modernize, and allow additional entryway signs throughout the existing subdivision. Uh, the Metro District, District had begun updating their existing signs, but cannot update any more, nor can they install any more without an amendment to the existing PUD. Uh, here's a look at the existing PUD sign schedule. Uh, so you'll notice on the far right column, uh, the first row for residential, it is capped off at four. And so therefore, they need to amend the, this PUD sign schedule to allow more than four. And so that's why we're here tonight. Here's the first sheet of the proposed PUD. Uh, it's just a standard cover page with a vicinity map and other language. The second page is what will show uh, the amendments to the, the original PUD. Again, just a brief vicinity map. And I have a, a zoomed in. Uh, slide on the, on the next slide of the sign schedule so you can see it better. Uh, but you can kind of see there the, the elevations and the design of the, of the updated signs. So here's a, here's a blow up of the, of the sign schedule on the proposed PUD. So you'll notice now on the far right column in the first row for residential, it does distinguish between two different types of residential signs, but also it allows one pair of these signs per each subdivision entry point. And I have a, a figure uh, later in this presentation that will show you where, the, where those proposed uh, areas will be. Uh, it's important to note too that these the sign designs on the, on the proposed PUD are conceptual and they're subject to change through the sign permit process with community development. Uh, the new signs that are installed, if this amendment is approved, will match the design of the existing signs on site that have already been upgraded. And all the signs must meet the size and setback standards that were detailed in that sign schedule and also just meet our LDC standards for signs. Staff reviewed the PUD zone document amendment against the technical requirements of the city's PUD zone document standards and the policies of the comprehensive plan. Staff distributed this PUD amendment uh, for review to all of our relevant referral agencies. Uh, which do include utility companies, South Adams County Fire, and our internal city departments. Uh, the DRT did not have any concerns uh, with this proposed amendment. Uh, once again, the amendment only modifies the sign schedule of the, of the previously approved PUD. There's no proposed changes to the, the land use or the zoning or other aspects of that existing PUD. A couple of project benefits. Uh, the amendment would allow Potomac Farms Metro District to install signs in the future uh, or alter the design of the existing signs without having to come through the, uh, the PUD amendment process, uh, which will just save time um, on, on both sides. Uh, the addition of the entry A signs would, will also help with the subdivision identification uh, and improve the neighborhood appearance. 
So here's that figure that I had mentioned earlier. Uh, the red stars represent where existing signs are currently today, and the yellow circles are where the potential new signs could be installed. So a pair of, of the residential signs could be installed at each of those entry points, either along 104th, uh, Potomac Street, or there's a couple entryways from the adjacent subdivision, uh, which I believe is Turnberry. So to go through the, uh, the PUD zone document approval criteria, criteria A is uh, the PUD zone document is consistent with the policies and goals of the uh, comprehensive plan. Any applicable adopted area plan or community plan of the city or reflects conditions that have changed since the adoption of the comprehensive plan. Uh, staff does believe this meets the, this criteria and that has been detailed in the staff report as well. Criteria B, the zone document is consistent with any previously reviewed PUD concept schematic. Uh, the proposed addition of entry signs will have no impact on the original concept plan for this currently built out subdivision. And as I mentioned before, the underlying uses of single family detached homes will not be altered by this amendment. And so staff does find that this meets the criteria. Criteria C, the PUD addresses a unique situation, confers a substantial benefit to the city or incorporates creative site design such that it achieves the purposes set out in section 21-4370 and represents an improvement in quality over what could have been accomplished through strict applications of the otherwise applicable district or development standards. Uh, this may include, but is not limited to, improvements in open space, environmental protection, tree slash vegetation preservation, uh, efficient pr provision of streets, roads, and other utilities and services, unique architecture or design, or increased choice of living and housing environments. Um, and the analysis from staff is that the proposed entryway signs are unique in design and create a distinct sense of place when entering and driving by these subdivisions. And so staff does find that this application meets this criterion. Criteria D, the PUD complies with all applicable city standards, not otherwise modified or waived by the city. And staff does find that this application meets this criterion. The PUD is integrated and connected with adjacent development through street connections, sidewalks, trails, and similar features. Uh, once again, the, the post signs will have no impact on the existing connectivity with adjacent developments. And so staff does find that this application meets this criterion. Criteria F, to the maximum extent feasible, the proposal mitigates any potential significant adverse impacts on adjacent properties or on the general community. Uh, staff does believe that, that this application uh, meets this criterion as additional entry signs are not expected to have any significant adverse impacts on the adjacent properties. Criteria G, uh, sufficient public safety, transportation, and utility facilities and services are available to serve the subject property while maintaining sufficient levels of service to existing development. Uh, the analysis there is that the additional signs will actually help with subdivision identification and could provide benefits for public safety and navigation in the area as emergency responders would be able to identify the Potomac Farm subdivision more quickly. And so staff does find that this application meets this criterion. Criteria H, as applicable, the proposed phasing plan for development of the PUD is rational. Um, the subdivision is already built out there are no concerns with phasing, so staff finds that this criteria is not applicable. And finally, uh, criteria I, the same development could not be accomplished through the use of other techniques, such as height exceptions, variances, or minor modifications. Uh, to allow more signs uh, than the maximum stated in the current zone document, an amendment to the PUD uh, must be made. And so staff does find that this application meets this criteria. Uh, the development review team reviewed this case, uh, Z-722-00-21, at a meeting on November 18th, 2021, and the DRT made an official recommendation of approval for this case. The DRT recommends uh, for this PUD amendment request that the PUD meets the approval criteria for a PUD zone document amendment as set forth in the LDC and further recommends that the Planning Commission forward the PUD amendment request to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. All the required uh, public notification uh, was, was met, um, and as of February 28th, and actually as of today as well, the staff has received no requests for additional information or objections to these application requests. And with that, staff is available for questions. The applicant is here in person. And I do not believe they have a formal presentation, but they are available for questions if needed.
Thank you. Mr. Guerra, the, the one pair per entry, is that consistent with other PUD and other surrounding developments? Are we asking for somewhat similar approaches or more, or can you give us a sense of that? I, I don't know if it's similar or different, to be honest with you, right? Each, each subdivision up north has their own character that they're trying to represent. And so um, have, having, having one on either side of the entryway is not, I guess, not so far atypical that, that it alerted or various departments or agencies. Yeah. Are they going from four signs to five or from four signs to eight? So we're going from four signs to essentially a pair of signs at every entry point into the subdivision. So it's not a, it's not a hard number. Although there are a limited number of access points, we're opening it to allow them to have signs at every entry point into the subdivision. So this amendment would allow for eight signs? Correct. If there, there's four additional entry points that don't have signage currently, then yes, an additional eight would be allowed. Any further questions? Now I hear pub comments from the public for those in person. Anybody's in person, please step to the podium. Thank you, sir. Please state your uh, name and address. I'm Sheldon Marshall with Yesco Custom Signs. I am the AE on the, the project. I live at 956 West, 133rd Circle, Westminster, Colorado. Thank you. And I really don't have a whole lot to add. Dalton did a great presentation here. Uh, Dalton, if we can go back to the map with uh, the blue and the stars, or I'm sorry, the yellow potential and the existing and the stars. The red. Right there. Currently, we have four locations allowed in the existing PUD, as Dalton mentioned. Some have one sign, some have two signs. The additional signage immediately that we were looking to add to this uh, existing project that we were under contract with was two at 100, 107th right there, and then the one on Worcester Drive on the uh, west side of that corner there and then the other would be potential down the road. So as we look at sign count, we, we counted these as areas versus independent signs. So there's four signs versus um, seven that are actually there now. And as far as the fabrication method that we've used, um, we used a halo lighting individual letters that, talk about, that read Potomac Farms. And halo, as we know or may not know, is something that signs back onto a surface and then does a little one inch glow around the letters. So it's very subtle, it's unique for the neighborhood, and we really feel that this is um, almost a little bit incomplete with where we're at right now, and we would like to just continue to hit those, at least those two main spots uh, for new signage. So, and then with that, if there's any other questions on fabrication methods, I am here to answer those as well. Thank you for that information. Thank you. And thank you as well. I do appreciate the, um, the funny math count, the way that we're going about this, uh, if we want to call it that by uh, however you slice it or count it. But that's neither here nor there. That's a lot of signs. I appreciate the, uh, the salesman coming up to talk to us about this. I know funding is none of our business, but their HOA must have a heck of a lot of money to be able to uh, get this done <laughs> and um, setting a precedence uh, in the Northern Range in this particular subdivision. So uh, either, well, I'll leave it alone. Thank you. <laughs> Very proud, Mr. Amador. Anyone further from the public wish to step to the podium? Thank you, sir. Please state your name and address. Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, hearing me. Uh, my name is Harrison Tanksley. Uh, I'm the president of the Metro District for uh, Potomac Farms. And yeah, it's uh, been a pretty pricey project. <laughs> it's been a couple of years going. Um, 
Yeah, it's just the few extra signs that we needed. It's just that uh, 107th in the Worcester um, spot. Everything else is already there. Everything's lit up. Homeowners are really happy about it. Um, we've replaced all the fences along 104th. Everything looks real good. Um, we're working on a couple of other projects. We just did some open space for our community um, that allows uh, people to have a walking track um, with some trees, nature, that kind of thing. And then um, the last part that we're working on that we'd like to get going is um, we just picked up a piece of land that was owed to us by the developer. And um, I'm sure you guys will be hearing about that at some point, I'm not sure. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, we'd like to build a clubhouse for the community as well. So, so where we can do our own barbecues and community events and that kind of thing and hold our um, homeowners association there as well. So yeah, we're working on a few projects. Uh, we just refinanced our bonds and we do have a few, a few dollars to spend. Not too much, but we're on a budget. So, any additional questions for those signs or anything? Homeowners? No, I, thank you, Harrison, for the, the commentary in terms of the Metro District. Um, as the city of Commerce City, we are always talking about uh, image of the city when people pass by and what they see and what it looks like. Um, so to hear the improvements and that there's a funding source uh, available for this, you know, I would always say, uh, ask for more than what you need at this individual time so that you don't have to come back and ask again. Um, and I think just hearing the improvements and, you know, forgive me for my uh, comments earlier to the salesman, <laughs> but uh, hey, they must be doing good. So uh, I do appreciate that though. Thank yep. you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments from those in person? We'll now move to those that are online. Caitlin or Tricia, anybody online? If there is anybody that indicated that they did not want to speak that would like to now provide comments, please use your raised hand feature. That concludes the virtual comments of this case. Close our public comment for the case. Um, there were also members who were able to submit comments online and via mail. There were no comments received. So now we will move to, is there a motion for the case? I move that the Planning Commission enter a finding that the requested PUD zone document amendment for the property located at the northwest corner of East 104th Avenue and Worcester Drive contained in case Z-722-00-21 meet the criteria of the Land Development Code and based upon such finding re recommend that the City Council approve the PUD zone document amendment. Motion, is there a second? Second. Any discussion from the commissioners? Call for a vote. Caitlin? If you could please vote electronically. Well, the motion has passed. Five yeses, uh, zero noes. Thank you again for the presentation for the applicant. We will now move on to the rest of our agenda. Um, any commission business that we need to discuss as a team? Um, if uh, staff could just uh, double check that my email address is correct for my uh, denvergov.org uh, email. I'm not sure that I'm getting things right now. And so um, I know last things were correct and then somehow they got shifted to my business account and then got, and I'm not sure that they shifted that back just yet, but that would be great if we could just double check that on the board business side. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin and Tricia, for following up with Mr. Amador. Anything else? Mr. Geiger, any legal business we need to discuss tonight? No, nothing real legal, thank you. Steve, any staff business we need to discuss? Just uh, let the commissioners know we will have a meeting in, in uh, April on April 5th, so we do have some cases lined up for that night. Great. We will adjourn our meeting. Thank you all. Just to clarify, there's a study session item listed on the agenda. So okay. I heard you can technically 
Open. I think we're not 100% adjourned. We're adjourning the public here. We're adjourning the public meeting to head into our transition to the study session. Either reopen a new meeting or just make a presentation that it's a presentation that's happening. Thank you for that. Maybe take a five minute break and then we'll start the, the run. Are you guys ready to roll? <laughs> If you'd like to take five minutes, it's fine. This won't take five minutes, but... Uh, okay, well, let's roll. <laughs> For those of you that I haven't met yet, I'm Jim Talbert. I'm the uh, new director of community development. I think this may be other than saying hello to a few of you the first ni night I was here. This is my first time talking to you. Uh, if Steve will get the presentation up, uh, just got a brief presentation. The city council, as you may know, has been <clears throat> really interested in trying to do something to assist our homeless community. We hired a homeless navigator uh, several months ago, and she's been working really hard to try to bring services and provide services. Uh, we also received money from the federal government for... Uh, I'm sorry. Um, Trish, are you able to pull up our presentation or our display? Well, okay. Right. There we go. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, anyway, we received uh, quite a bit of money from the federal government to try to to do something, and we've been looking at the possibility of, of building a facility, either a single room occupancy with, uh, with uh, social services provided, or what's been called here a navigation center. Uh, it's other places, it's a shelter care facility uh, where there would just be a place for the homeless to come during the day, get services, maybe take a shower, be able to store things, have mailboxes, any number of things, but anyway, there's a very difficult issue facing the, our community. Uh, right now in our land development code, there is no reference to anything if we want to build a facility. We, so we, as we were looking, there's no, no provision for an SRO. There's no provision for a shelter care facility. So uh, we've been looking at the, uh, at the request of council, trying to create some regulations. And again, tonight, we're just briefing you on this. We'll bring it back for public hearing. But uh, the purpose is to allow us to cr have creative solutions to address homelessness in the community with temporary or permanent uh, solutions. Uh, the, uh, uh, in Article 5 use table, we'll have to address where these things can go. And we're talking about three items. I'll get the definitions in a minute. Uh, shelter care, single room occupancy, and pallet shelters. Uh, in the definitions, we would add three definitions for shelter care, single room occupancy, and pallet shelter, and then a slight amendment to the residential multifamily uh, definition. Uh, where we would uh, propose to allow these are a shelter care facility as a conditional permit in R3 and R4, our multifamily residentials, and then a use by permit in C2 and use by right in C3, I1, and public. An SRO would be a use by right in R3 and R4, a uh, use by permit in C2 and use by right in C3, uh, and then a, a, an I1 and public. Use by permit in C2, I think I've misstated that. And a pallet shelter would be a continu uh, conditional use permit in R3 and 4, and a use by permit in C2, use by right in C3, I1 and public. And the difference in these, the reason you see that the, the, uh, the uh, shelter care facility is allowed in more in the commercial areas by right is it's more of a, an office, a service building than it is housing. So we want to differentiate there. Go ahead, Steve. A shelter care facility is described as a building that's used for provision of emergency overnight shelter, possibly, uh, for homeless, indigent, and other disadvantaged persons. And then the services that go uh, with that, crisis intervention, counseling, service referral, hotline, similar social service function. You know, we would anticipate that if we, if we build this facility, that it would be primarily an area where, again, we'd have a kitchen, showers, laundry facilities, storage, offices for agencies to come in and meet and try to do job training, provide uh, uh, networks to get uh, services for these individuals, and have a room that could be a gathering room for meals or if we serve meals, but also if we had a night, uh, had a week like last week, we might put cots in and have an emergency shelter to get people out of tents and off of the trails and come in and have a place. It wouldn't be, in this facility, would not be uh, housing all the time just in emergencies. The next definition is for a single room occupancy. It's, a, it's essentially an apartment building uh, with a couple of differences. Uh, the dwelling units are built 
uh, typically for one, no more than two individuals. Um, and they are typically no more than 450 square feet. So they're very small units intending again to provide permanent supportive housing for uh, individuals. Uh, and the, you know, you'll note that the units must contain food preparation, sanitary facilities, and it must provide counseling and training for social, behavioral, and job seeking training skills for residents. So it's not just an apartment where people come and live, but it has to have the social services in place, has to be a place for them to, to uh, be able to get a meal and, and, or, or prepare their own meal. It's more of a permanent solution. Again, designed as transition, but to get people off the street and give them a more settled environment to get services. A pallet shelter um, is a fairly new thing that's being built as a, a way for uh, temporary housing for homeless. Uh, they're typically very small, uh, 64 square feet to slightly over 100. Uh, they can have actually up to four people. Typically, they only have one, but they can have bunks in them. So if you have a family, they could stay uh, in them. They're wired for electricity. They contain room uh, for one to four beds. They have shelving for storage, operable windows, locking doors and windows. Uh, they don't have anything else in them. Uh, so restrooms, hand washing facilities, showers, laundry facilities can be provided in separate structures on the site uh, to serve residents and social services again must be provided. The first example in the Denver Metro that I'm aware of these is in Aurora at the Salvation Army facility and it's a, it's a great way to get people out of tents or sleeping bags on the ground and give them something a little more permanent so they can get more stabilized. And so we have a lot of interest in providing uh, one or more of these facilities in uh, Commerce City. And then the, for multifamily, uh, we've added, we've realized that because of pallet shelters, we need to do this, but we're also seeing a new use that's coming around. Uh, and we've added this last sentence that says, in addition, single family detached dwellings may be considered as a multifamily product when they're located within one legally platted lot and no replat of individual buildings or platting may occur. It's apparently a nationwide trend that we're seeing build to rent projects that are out there. We've actually had a couple of them that they're PUDs allowed, but we wanted to, you know, we felt like we'd kill two birds with one stone with this. We'd get the pallet shelters, which would fit this definition also, but um, we could take care of if we have the bill to rents and uh, people propose those. So that's, a, that's a, a very quick run through of this. Again, it's, it's uh, the schedule, thank you, Steve, is tonight for a study session, bring it back next month for, uh, uh, for a uh, Planning Commission recommendation, we're going to take it to City Council for study session and then try to get the uh, uh, adoption done pretty quickly. We're, we're moving fairly fast. We have to obligate funds uh, by June. Uh, and so we have to commit to the federal government what we're going to build and what we're going to do with them. And so that's one reason for the urgency in getting this before you and having this study session tonight. Be glad to answer any questions. Are people staying in these facilities, these proposed facilities, are they required to uh, take part in the social services, the job training, uh, all, in, all of the services that are provided? The services that they need, yes, sir. If they, that would be a condition of living in the facilities. Got it. Again, if it's the if it's emergency housing in the shelter care for a night or two, no. But but that's. That's there to provide those services uh, to people. Again, it may not be housed, but they can come there for the day. They can wash their clothes. They can take a shower. They can uh, they can get services. But, and, but okay, so but if you live there on a more permanent basis, you're tied to these. Right. If if it's, they were in the pallet shelters or the SRO, they would be required to uh, participate in the services. Are you thinking that we're not seeing this again until it comes? to to our recommendation? Is this the only study session that you anticipate? I'm sorry, I didn't. Is this the only study session that you anticipate us having on this topic uh, before it, it comes back to our recommendation? Because We'll bring it back to you for a recommendation in public hearing. And, uh, but, you know, any, any of you have any questions between now and when we do that, we'd be happy to answer them or, you know, we can present uh, again and more data at that time if you, if you like. And what do you anticipate that recommendation look like? Modifications to the code. Modif I mean, what, what do you anticipate you coming back there's with? Three pieces to it, really. One is to recommend the addition of the three new definitions to the land development code. The second is to modify the definition of multifamily in the land development code, and then the third is to 
add the, uh, the areas where these things could be located within the city. So it would be a three-part recommendation. And I believe, Steve, we would probably take it as, as two separate actions, one to deal with the definitions and one to bring to deal with the location. It'd be two different ordinance motions. Right. The one to define the definitions. Correct. One defines the definitions, and then one defines the, um, the use, allowed zoning districts. Yeah, the allows use, because I think that was key on your other one, right? I mean, you, you talked about the conditional versus the use by right, right? I think that would be some hesitation, right, for a use by right where this commission or city council would not be see, you know, a specific area getting developed with one of these definitions, right? Versus right. a conditional permit that we would get to take at an individual basis of where they get set up. And I will tell you from all my experience, I've never seen one of these that was not, that was built, that wasn't built with the government, the local government being a primary player in it. So I think there's some protection there. You know, private sector is not going to come in and build an SRO because they can't make the numbers work unless they've got significant involvement from the local government. So and I think that's, that's one of the reasons we felt like some of these, you know, they could be by right in some areas because, again, we'll be doing them or we'll be partnering more than likely with anybody that does. I guess personally, I would have some hesitation if it, it if there would be a use by right where you know it didn't get reviewed on an individual basis, right? We, to, in my opinion, we would always want to see you know some type of conditional use, so that we are taking at an individual basis of where these things might be established. And and if you know if that's the recommendation y'all want to make, that's fine. I mean, again, because um, it's just another layer of protection. I, I think that. It's just, like you said, that was a very brief overview. It's just my initial reaction to what you presented. Again, we're, we're happy to, to talk more. We just, I we've got to obligate our money, so we want to try to. I know, Mr. We Mr. Amador, you, you, <laughs> you have experience with some of this in, in Denver as well, because I do think Denver has other, you said only Aurora, but I thought, I remember seeing Denver. Does Denver have some of the? So um, Denver created a program called HOST, and the General Services Department, which I run, um, basically is the backbone that uh, services all of the uh, safe outdoor spaceless spaces and homeless shelters along with security. Um, that's my division that's helping out with that. Um, the first thing that comes to mind, and I do echo what uh, the chairman of the board has to say, that uh, we do need more controls on this. So my ears definitely perked when um, I saw a single family R3, R4 with use by right. Um, I think there has to be some controls on this because when this thing starts to get out of control, um, you need a little more uh, oversight, not to say that government needs that, but I think you need those controls. Um, and then I think since this is our study session, I do want to take back and maybe ask out of curiosity, um, the Northern Range is a lot of PUD, and so these housing developments are PUDs and what that looks like in terms of uh, will everything land in the core city because of the zoning and a PUD may or may not, and right now I'm going to anticipate will not allow uh, homeless shelters or safe outdoor spaces by the zoning definitions uh, end up in the Northern Range. Would that be a fair statement or how are we looking at that as a city because this is this is ramrodded right now, um, and I I don't know that we're asking the right questions um, to be able to make sure that everything doesn't end up in the core city. You know I I think that the PUDs that are there now that allow multifamily, you know, they could they could build something like an SRO, but they wouldn't be required to have the the services in them. So if they allow multifamily, they could if they wanted to build a building that served that population. I don't anticipate it because, again, the, the difficulty, you know, and the likelihood is you're right. It's going to be more than likely in the core city because for the time being, because that's where access is. There's, you know, there's very difficult access to get in the Northern Range, but it, they're not precluded from going into the Northern Range. But a PUD would have to be written in a way that would allow that type of use. And so from a... Um, policy perspective and the way the PUDs are written, um, the topic to make sure that these spaces simply do not end up in the core city altogether. Um, we did see that with um, the 
uh, marijuana policy where the PUDs did not allow for uh, retail marijuana, whether the voters approve that or not. And so um, I'm, I'm super concerned that the homeless population is gonna end up in the city, in the core city, if you will. Um, and I would also say that uh, I understand these small units that are out there, you know, 64 square feet to 100 square feet. Um, you know, I would urge you to uh, take a, a better look at um, how you're spending these government funds because in, at the end of the day, uh, these small shelters uh, end up having no value at the end, basically when uh, it gets burnt down or someone utilizes it and then you're trying to clean this up, right? Um, the better way to go, in my opinion, about um, homeless shelters is to uh, identify, uh, I'm gonna call them hotel slash motel types of configurations uh, so that at the end of the day, the spend happens from the government, but at least there's something tangible at the end of the day as an asset, as opposed to, hey, you burn this money and it's gone. Um, so I'm, I'm super cautious about seeing this presentation. Like, I, I need to review this again. And I think that's uh, the chairman's concern, and I, I don't want to speak for the entire uh, planning commission. I get it. There's some dollars that need to be committed projects that need to be identified because that's also going on um, in other municipalities as well. But I'm super cautious with, um, again, youth by right. And so we'll, we will not have an opportunity to uh, retake a look at this before it comes to vote because I have a feeling that when this comes to the vote as an advisory piece for the Planning Commission, it's already too far down the road. And so I'm, I'm concerned. It was Steve and I will talk about seeing if we can set something up to to do that, and I, you know, I'll provide you with uh, information from other pallet shelter communities. I, I hear your concerns, and again, these are these are intended to be temporary to get people off the street and get them rehoused somewhere else that works. They're not intended to be long-term stays for, for people, but they've been very successful across the country, and it's very fair. I've I've done a lot of research. You haven't to be able to get that information to you, and we'll do that, uh, and we'll have another session where we can just address that and talk about it. Um, you know, it's it's just one phase of, of dealing with the homeless population. Uh, it's a kind of a new thing that's been very successful. And, um, you know, one of the reasons to build them is because to build 30 apartment units would cost, you know, million plus dollars. To build 30 pallet shelters is about a half a million dollars to get that emergency housing. So, uh, but again, we'll, I, I, I hear your comments and we'll figure out a time and we'll get the information and uh, we can have a much more in-depth conversation about it. Thank you. Those are great comments. And that's not stated for our March. We have a March study session, right? But that's, that's probably not on the docket. It's, it looks like your work session with city council was much earlier than that, right? I think we, we're going to, we're not going to go to council for a work session until we have something from you. No. We won't, you know, we don't want to get them to, vote there or say they're in favor of something that puts pressure on you at that point. We'd rather get it from you, let you them get the benefit of your thoughts before we take it to them. Yeah, I would agree. Just like what Mr. Amador said, right? That's a lot to absorb with some of those changes that could have larger effects in my opinion. So right. it'd be good to work through that. That's all I had. If you, if you we'll, we'll get something on the, books and get you more information and have a better discussion of it. Thank you. Anything further from? Actually, um, Steve, if you could give them maybe just a brief update on the joint study session for the 28th, they were asking about maybe some more details. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I have more details at this time. So stay tuned. We will send you more details when we know them. There you go. Well, that was my bad, too. I, I mean, I got the 28th mixed up. I was thinking it was this week, so. Can I just ask for clarification what study session we're talking about? It's for the comp plan update. That being said, no further discussions involved. Our meeting is adjourned. Thank you.